um, DC lesson two, part C, looking at voltage sources, their effects of an electric current. So about this particular lesson, we're going to look at the effects of electrical current on the human body again, just to in a little bit more detail, and what we can do to protect against unwanted effects. We're going to look at primary and secondary cells, so a little bit more around the chemistry of what we can do with electricity. We're going to look at uh, different forms of energy, conservation of energy and energy efficiency. So protection against the effects of electrical current. Um, this is section 2.3. Um, of course, our recommended tool, uh, textbook being Electrical Principles by Phillips. So to begin with, protection against the effects of an electrical current, um, AS3000, which is the Australian standard for all electrical work, specifies ways of minimising the risk of an electric shock. So the, there's two ways. The first is protect against direct contact through a combination of insulation, barriers and enclosures, and placing exposed electrical contacts out of reach. So what we might call isolation being able to isolate the electrical energy from anyone being able to get anywhere near touching it. Uh, the second one is protection against indirect contact or inadvertent contact, I would have rather said, due to a fault conditions through the use of devices such as automatically disconnecting the power, e.g. safety switches or RCD, which stands for residual current device. It's a special kind of circuit breaker. So, direct contact. You can see here a young picture of a young fellow, and he, for some reason, is touching a live conductor. So, here's our live conductor. And you can see the electrical path. So, it's going up his arm, down through his chest, down through his legs, and into the body of Earth. So, how much current will flow? Um, is quite variable. It's going to depend on um, the quality of the resistance of earth. It's going to depend on how good insulator his boots are. And it's going to depend on the day on uh, things like how dry his skin is. Um, will determine how much energy is going to go down through his body. So. Direct contact with a live conductor can cause current to flow through your body to ground and uh, that obviously can have some devastating effects. Um, indirect contact is when you come into something due to a fault and um, you can see here the outside of our electric toaster. Somehow the active has got to the uh, outside of the toaster and the outside of your toaster has become live. Of course, we'd hope that that was bonded <laughs> to protective earth. That's the first step. If that was bonded to uh, protective earth, called PE, protective earth, then sufficient current would flow to cause the circuit breaker to trip. And um, the circuit breaker protecting here in Australia has to be a residual current device. So here's the circuit breaker and here's your active and your neutral. So we've got our active and our neutral. And what that does, it measures the amount of current goes going in and out of the device. And if the difference in current I'll just go diff for difference. If the difference is greater than 30 milliamps for most standard RCD breakers, milliamps, then it will trip the device. So if you've got current going down the active and then it goes down to earth through your body and that current gets above 30 milliamps, the RCD should trip. The same for our fault on our electric kettle if the active conductor should become exposed and we get current 
flowing down to earth to the body of earth whether it's through you or through something else and that exceeds 30 milliamps then the circuit breaker is going to trip because of the RCD or the residual current device the next thing we're going to talk about is the primary cell um, this is the chemistry of storing electrical energy as chemicals so a primary cell is a battery that is designed to be used once and then discarded and not to be recharged with electricity and re reused like a secondary cell can be in general the electrochemical reaction occurring in the cell is non-reversible rendering the cell unable to be recharged now typically these cells have carbon rod down the center and you can see here the carbon rod and the carbon rod is the plus side of the battery then we have an electrolyte of some kind in here that's the blue the electrolyte in this particular case it's manganese dioxide paste and then we have the outer case which is normally zinc and that's the actual negative electrode so the zinc becomes the negative at the other end of your battery and then there's a little bit of air space in here to allow for expansion and contraction caused by temperature and that's it that's your dry cell uh, remember it is unable to be recharged and if you were to recharge it you will damage the cell you'll find that the chemical will leak out and in worst case um, the cell can catch fire and overheat so it's very important that once you've uh, used a primary cell you dispose of it appropriately um, but you cannot recharge it and it's dangerous to do so the secondary cell um, is more like the car battery and um, so it's rechargeable battery a secondary cell or accumulator is a type of electrical battery which can be re recharged discharged recharged discharged recharged etc so what we have here is we normally have plates of zinc and lead so we normally have lead and zinc and we have an electrolyte so these plates are sitting in a solution so normally there's a solution in here of acid so it's normally uh, water and sulfuric acid so it's a light solution of sulfuric acid that's why we uh, normally do with batteries that are completely sealed these days we don't try to fiddle with the acid or top up the water acid combination etc so the the lead acid battery rechargeable and the most common place you'll see those is um, your car battery of course um, in your toys and things you might have the lithium ion batteries again rechargeable next thing we need to think about is the conservation of energy so uh, in physics and in chemistry the law of conservation of energy states that the total energy of an isolated system remains constant it is said to be conserved over time this law means that energy can neither be created or destroyed rather can only be transformed or transferred from one form to another hence Einstein's E equals mc squared so energy is mass multiplied by the square of speed of light so it doesn't matter what we're doing uh, with our boiler that's creating electrical energy we're taking um, energy locked up in coal we're burning the coal releasing the energy into a f into the feet form of heat so there's one conversion we're going from mass to heat with our coal that heat is then being transformed into steam another form of energy that steam is then driving a steam turbine around converting the steam energy into rotating energy 
the rotating mechanical energy is going into a generator that generator is rotating a magnetic field converting that mechanical energy into electrical energy so we haven't created or destroyed energy we've simply taken the energy that was stored in the carbon of the coal transferred it through at least three or four states and eventually ended up with electrical energy so matter and energy nothing's ever created or lost it's only ever converted from one form to another and that's called the conservation of energy which leads us to energy efficiency so we need to understand a little bit about energy efficiency and this is about the amount of power in compared to the amount of power out and in between we have what we call losses so this little diagram um, we have here we have input of some kind so we have energy being put in so for example um, we might be putting in so many watts of mechanical energy into a generator might be our process and then we're outputting that energy in the form of electrical energy of some kind so we might be going from mechanical through a generator into electrical but not everything that is put in mechanically ends up going out electrically and we call the difference the losses so that's the losses and there's all different kinds of losses which we'll discuss in a moment but let's look at how we can calculate efficiency so how do we calculate efficiency as a percentage the first thing we need to realize that efficiency is simply the ratio between the output and the input so the output divided by the input so output divided by the input that's it that's the ratio but if we want to turn it into a percentage we simply multiply by 100 so efficiency percentage is the M the output divided by the input simply multiply by 100 gives us a percentage so what are some of the common losses in a generator so let's say for example again that um, we have a prime mover of some kind so we've got mechanical energy going in we've got say a generator rotating magnetic field and we're producing some electrical energy out here typical losses the first is this one here what we call I squared R losses um, I squared R is the formula for power for losses in the conductors so the conductors are made of resistors and the resistors carry the current so any heating that occurs in the generator that's produced from current going through the conductors is called I squared R and that comes out in the form of heat the other heat loss is what we call iron losses so all generators are made up of soft iron and we've got those iron molecules being magnetized and demagnetized magnetized and demagnetized and that also creates heat and that's called the iron losses and then finally we have friction losses so the, the the bearings the simple friction losses caused by the bearings is both heat and a little bit of noise so our losses those are the three big typical losses IR squared iron and friction so let's do a little example so we have a steam prime mover delivering 200 megawatts of power to an electrical generator the generator in turn puts out 196 megawatts of electrical energy and they've asked us to calculate the percent efficiency and the percent losses 
So if you remember our formula for percent efficiency was simply the output divided by the input multiplied by 100. So if we take our 196 divide by 200 and multiply by 100 we get 98% efficient. So here's my 100% going in but I'm only getting 96 megawatts out therefore at this end I'm only 98% of it's getting through. Where's the other 2% going? Here in the losses. So we take our 100, subtract the 98, giving us 2%. So we have 2% losses in heat and noise. So summarizing our um, whole chapter, our whole uh, lesson two, electrical energy is produced by converting other forms of electric of energy. So we turn mechanical energy, chemical energy, heat, light into electrical energy. Electrical energy is converted to other forms of energy by the electric load. Be it a light, a motor, a heater element. Large alternators driven by steam turbines give mechanical energy, generate most of Australia's electrical energy. So most of our base, base load, it's called, is done with coal-fired steam turbine generator stations. An alternator has coils of wire arranged so that they intersect with a moving magnetic field, therefore producing electrical energy. Renewable energy sources that can drive an alternator include geothermal, we only do a little bit of that in Australia, solar, we do more and more of that, just in, got some big ones and some mostly small ones, hydro, we have a fair bit of hydro in Australia, but again it's only used to take off the peak loads, biogas we have, and wind is now producing about 1%. Solar panels are photoelectric devices that convert light energy into electrical energy. Remember, photovoltaic cell is the same as an LED, just being used the other way around. Friction can be used to produce high voltages. An example is a Wimhurst machine or a Van de Graaff generator. The electric cell produces electricity by converting chemical energy to electrical energy. Really, we call those batteries. Charging a battery or a cell reverses the chemical action that occurred when the battery was being discharged. You can only do that with a secondary cell, of course. Electric motors, transformers, electromagnetics work by way of a magnetic effect of the electric current. Electrolysis is the process of passing electric current through an electrolyte from one end to the other, e.g. electroplating. Discharge lamps are filled with gas to produce light energy when electric current passes through that gas. The most typical one is the fluorescent tube. UV light is produced through the um, mercury vapour gas and the phosphorus inside the tube converts that to white light. Physiological effects of electric current are unwanted byproduct and pose dangers to all forms of biological life. And it includes things like muscle contraction, particular fibrillation, your heart, your heart going into just pulsing, burns, and of course, if it's severe enough, may lead to death. The effects caused by electric current include heating, always going to get heating. And again, it's I'm going to, to, to harp this one because they often ask this in assessments. You're always going to get heating you're always going to get magnetism and sometimes you'll get mechanical, sometimes you'll get luminescence and sometimes you'll get physiological. But heating and magnetism are the two that always occur. Heat is produced in a conductor because the conductors or conductors have some form of resistance. And current flowing in a conductor creates a magnetic field around the conductor 
and if you coil the conductor up it makes an electromagnet you're just intensifying the magnetic field by coiling up the wire chemical effects of an electric current include electrolysis and voltaic effect or the cell electric cell slash battery Galvanic corrosion is caused when two different metals are in electrical contact creating an electric cell. So if you get an electrolyte between two dissimilar metals, you're going to get galvanic corrosion. A metal surface can be protected from corrosion with a sacrificial anode that corrodes instead of the metal that's being protected. And we saw that with the zinc. Fluorescent lamps are an example of the luminescence effect of an electric circuit and so is an LED also does that so I hope you've enjoyed uh, all of lesson 2 a B and C as we've learned a little bit about how electrical potentials are created the electrical currents that then flow and how we use those electrical currents to do particular tasks